Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on supporting migrant and immigrant students experiencing homelessness. Please take a minute to mute yourself now. My name is Zach Stumbo, and I am the State Homeless Coordinator. I'm delighted to have you all here today, and I'm excited to be joined by our guest speaker, Karen Rice from Schoolhouse Connection. Continuing in this webinar, you will see our accessibility features, such as an interpreter and live captioning automatically on your screen. We hope these features improve your learning experience. Now, I'm excited to introduce once again our guest speaker, Karen Rice. Karen is a renowned expert in the field of homeless education, and she has extensive experience working with Schoolhouse Connection, a national organization dedicated to ensuring educational rights and opportunities for children and youth experiencing homelessness. Karen brings a wealth of knowledge about the McKinney-Vento Act with her, and I'm grateful that she's joined us once again today to share her expertise. During today's session, we will provide an overview of supporting immigrant and migrant youth experiencing homelessness, including important terminology, about McKinney-Vento McKinney eligibility and best practices from the field. Before we dive into the content, I'd like to remind you of the expectations. This webinar is designed to be interactive and engaging, and we encourage you to ask questions, share your thoughts, and participate in the discussion throughout the session. We want this to be collaborative learning experiences for everyone. To ensure smooth operation, please be mindful of these norms. Today's video will be recorded for those who could not be present. Please ensure that your video feed is professional in nature and not distracting should you keep it on. Please keep your audio muted unless you're asking a question. Please use the hand raising icon to gain the presenter's attention to ask a question. The chat function is available for question asking, and it will also be part of the recorded content. At the end of the webinar, a link will be added to the chat for you to complete to earn your ELA credit. That's E-I-L-A. You must stay to get that link or email myself or Jennifer White for the link if you are joining us by phone. I will be sending out links by request after this video renders. You must complete one form per video to earn each ELA credit. Thank you once again for joining us today. And now I'd like to invite Karen to get us started. Now I'll be sharing the PowerPoint and Karen, you'll let me know as you'd like, um, like each slide to, um, you would like each uh, slide to progress. Yes, thank you very much, just, Zach. Just a second while I pull that up. All right, well, thank you, everyone. It is so wonderful to be here with you all again. Um, I want to just start out by saying we have a lot of information to cover today, and we're probably not going to get to it all. Um, and so I know that and I recognize that ahead of time. Um, but one thing that I wanted to do was at least to provide you with the information. So when we get to the end, there's some additional slides um, about some different kind of pieces of the immigration process. And so we probably won't get to have a chance to cover a lot of that, but I wanted you to at least have the information so that you could see it. Um, and I want to kind of preface all of this by saying you don't have to be experts on immigration or on supporting migrant students. Um, in your work. What you need to do is know who your community partners are to maybe make referrals back and forth. Um, but I know that that this can be a little bit of an overwhelming topic. So just kind of want to set the stage for that a little bit. Um, so Zach, you can go to the next slide. So if you're not familiar with Schoolhouse Connection, um, I have been here with you a number of times. This is our final webinar in our webinar series that we've done. Um, but just to give you a little context, Schoolhouse is a national nonprofit um, and we work to overcome homelessness through education. So that looks a lot of different ways and we've talked about a number of those ways, um, but would love to connect with you. So um, feel free to browse our website. We've got a lot of resources. Would love for you to sign up for our newsletters to um, stay up to date on resources and things like that. So. I'll just leave it at that for today and we can dive right into our topics. 
Next slide, please, Zach. So I always like to set the stage when I'm talking about immigration um, to have some terminology that we use. And I think this is really important because in the media and in um, just kind of the world in general in which we live, a lot of people use terms interchangeably or they're not totally sure what they mean. And so I like to just set the stage. So as we're talking today, this is the terminology that we're going to be using for today's presentation. Um, I do like to include English learners on my terminology um, information. Of course, we know that not all English learners are immigrant or migrant students. And on the flip side, not all immigrant or migrant students are English learners. Um, so I just like to put that out there, but I think it's important to know um, who our English learners are and that we may have students um, that we're working with who are English learners. Um, okay, so let's talk about the difference between immigrant and migrant. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so as we talk about immigrant and migrant students, for the purpose of our presentation today, this is what we're going to be referring to. <coughs> Excuse me. So an immigrant is a person who moves to a country and plans to stay permanently. Sometimes, of course, we know that may not happen. They may not stay permanently, but that's the plan. <coughs> so sorry. So when they move to somewhere, that's their plan is to stay and they intend to stay and settle in. On the flip side of that, a migrant is someone who is moving and who is highly mobile because either the student or the family are involved in seasonal agriculture or fishing work and it's very tied to kind of that source of income. And so we know that those families move frequently during a school year and their plan is not to stay. And so for example, as I've mentioned before, I live in Wisconsin. We have migrant families who come to Wisconsin um, for our apple picking season and for our summer crops and things like that, um, green beans and cucumbers. And I used to work in migrant education, so I could list off um, all of the different crops that we've got in Wisconsin. But we know that those families are here for a very short period of time because in Wisconsin it gets cold and there are no more crops in the winter. And so then they leave and they go somewhere else and they come back the following summer. So that's kind of the difference. Um, I know, again, in the media and in the news, we often hear um, immigrant and migrant talked about differently, but kind of in our educational context, this is what we're looking at for the difference between immigrant and migrant. So I wanted to just kind of set the stage with that. And on the next slide, um, a couple of additional um, terms that I want to just familiarize you with. Um, again, in the media and just with um, kind of the world we live in, we often hear um, the, we often hear the words refugees and asylees used interchangeably. And again, there is a difference. And I want to just kind of provide some clarification around that. So the essential difference between those who are refugees and those who are asylees or seeking asylum um, is where they're located when they're going through that immigration process. So refugees are um, people who are not in the US when they start that initial immigration process. And asylees are in the US when they go through that initial immigration process. So just for the sake of clarification. <coughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry, just for the sake of that clarification, I wanted to make sure that you had that information. My voice is failing me today, I apologize. <coughs> okay, now I wanna focus on unaccompanied youth. And I have here in this slide, unaccompanied alien minors. And I wanna be very clear that I will not be using the term alien minors. I include this in this slide because this is really important, again, of what you might hear in the media or what you might hear in your communities or um, whoever it is that's using this, you might hear students referred to as alien minors. I do not like that term um, when we're talking about students. I'm not going to use it, but I wanted you to at least know that this is, if you hear that somewhere, that this is who is being referred to. So when we talk about unaccompanied youth, we're talking about actually two different kinds of unaccompanied youth today. So we're talking about unaccompanied, unaccompanied youth from an immigration perspective. And those are youth who are coming to the US um, without parents or without legal guardians. Uh, many of them are older youth who might be coming to work or to live with or stay with family members or friends. Um, so those are kind of, that's referring to unaccompanied youth in the immigration sense. Of course, we know unaccompanied youth in the McKinney-Vento arena 
is also called the same thing. And so it's a little bit confusing when we talk about it. And so as we go through, I'll clarify who I'm talking about. Um, unaccompanied youth from an immigration perspective or unaccompanied youth from a make an evento perspective. So when we talk about unaccompanied homeless youth, so from a make an evento perspective, we're talking about children and youth who lack fixed, regular and adequate nighttime residence and who are also not under the care of a parent or legal guardian. And I do wanna say that there is significant overlap with our unaccompanied youth who are unaccompanied um, immigrant youth and who are unaccompanied homeless youth. Many of our unaccompanied immigrant youth are eligible under McKinney Vento as unaccompanied homeless youth. So I know that's a little confusing, um, but just wanted to kind of clarify that. Um, and again, just kind of provide you those terms so that you are familiar with them and you can see them and maybe refer back to them as needed. Um, on the next slide, I want to talk about educational rights of undocumented children and youth. And I think this is really important because many districts across the country have seen an increase in the numbers of their um, students who are coming, particularly immigrant students. Um, so I do want to say that children and youth living in the United States have the right to attend and participate fully in public schools, regardless of their immigration status. So schools, LEAs, any LEA administered preschool program, any kind of public school program cannot ask about a student or family's immigration status or discourage a family from seeking enrollment because of their immigration status. Um, so we're not asking for social security numbers. We're not asking for immigration paperwork or citizenship documentation. None of that is needed for a child to be enrolled in school. I also want to say that it's important to note that schools and LEA administered preschool programs um, cannot be contacting um, ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or other law enforcement officials, officials about a student or family's immigration status. Um, and I know a number of years ago, when I was still working in a school, um, there were a lot of concerns around um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement showing up at school. We want to make sure that school is a safe place for our children and youth. And so we don't want to do something that's going to either discourage a student from being in school or that's going to put a student in an unsafe situation. Okay, and that can go to the next slide, please. Um, so again, undocumented children and youth have the right to participate fully in school. And I like to say this more than once because I think it's really important. Um, and so anytime you have a, a child or youth who comes in to enroll, again, regardless of their immigration status, we want to look at their living situation because it doesn't matter if they're documented or undocumented, they can still be eligible for McKinney Vento. So for any student who meets that definition of under McKinney Vento, so again, lacking fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, um, regardless of their immigration status, we want to make sure that we're addressing barriers to their enrollment and their participation, and that includes transportation. Um, so again, looking at that nighttime residence first and foremost. Now I do wanna say that sometimes it happens where we have barriers that we can't address with our undocumented youth. Um, so I'm gonna give you a couple examples and I'm gonna offer some solutions and I'm gonna say just kind of upfront as a caveat, sometimes you have to think a little more creatively. Um, it's also kind of a challenge because there are students who are not aware of their immigration status. So when I worked in a school, I worked with a lot of undocumented youth and there were a couple of times and instances when things came up where I, I would say to a student, okay, I just need to talk to you about the requirements for this course. And the child or youth didn't know that they were undocumented. Their parents had never shared that with them because they wanted them to have a normal school experience. So when some of these things came up, it was that conversation was happening for the first time. So I tell you that by way of saying, you may need to be sensitive in your conversations about this. Um, so for example, um, any career and technical education services um, that may require a social security number or employment authorization um, could be a barrier to students participating in that program. I worked with a student once who was going through a CNA class, our certified nursing assistant, and the student got all the way through the class and was just about to enter kind of that clinical piece. And we got to that point and, and I, that was CTE classes were new to me. I wasn't familiar with the CNA process or I could have addressed this up front, but the student came to me and said, I can't fill out this particular, um, it was a kind of a licensure form that then they would go through their clinical hours and they'd become licensed as a CNA. 
um, the student said, I can't fill out this particular licensure form because I don't have a social security number. And immediately I went, oh my gosh, we, we've never addressed this before. What do we do? We certainly can't put this student in jeopardy. So I went to the teacher and I shared the information with the teacher because I felt that that teacher needed to know for the purpose of the a student completing the class. And we were able to navigate some of the barriers. Um, of course, the student could not participate in that, those clinical hours and could not become licensed, but we were able to find a way around that piece so the student could still get credit for that class. Um, so that can be a barrier for students, whether that's a career in technical education or whether that's some other kind of licensure or apprenticeship program, it's important to just know that that may be a barrier for students um, and to kind of have a plan and figure out how you might address that. Um, again, having those conversations can be very difficult with students. Um, so just be aware as you're kind of navigating that full participation. It's not that we're not allowing them to participate in fully in that class. It's just that there may be that other barrier. Um, in addition, there may be times when foreign travel um, is a part of a class. Uh, I know when I worked in a school district, our uh, music program traveled to Europe, um, I think on a number of occasions to do some concerts and different things. Um, and our undocumented students that participated in those classes were not able to participate in those trips. Um, and so um, just again, being aware that these are barriers for some of our undocumented students and wanting to help find ways to navigate those barriers. So to not, we don't want to say, great, then you can't participate in band, then it's okay, let's figure out a different plan for you, or let's make sure you're getting credit for as much of this as you can or something like that. Go to the next slide, Zach. Okay, so I've mentioned this a few times, so I'm going to kind of go quickly through this, but um, McKinney-Vento does apply to um, any child or youth, again, immigrant, migrant, um, any youth who is lacking fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. Um, and so you will see these housing situations that are eligible under McKinney-Vento with our immigrant and migrant populations. Um, particularly, we know that the majority of our families who are identified under McKinney-Vento are in that shared housing situation. And we have heard that with um, some of the influx of migrant students um, and migrant families um, and immigrant students and immigrant families coming to the US, that there are even more shared housing situations happening. Um, so family or friends or community members may be taking in um, their immigrant families who are coming from similar countries or who they may have a connection to. And so we really want to be aware of these shared housing situations and make sure we're looking at them from a McKinney-Vento perspective. Sometimes we hear things like, well, that's just cultural. They share their housing anyway, or they might live in a multi-generational living situation anyway. Um, but we know that many of our families don't have any other option. And so I have a coworker um, who taught me the phrase, circumstance supported by cultural norms. And that's really the lens that we want to look through when we're thinking about that shared housing. So is it their circumstance that caused them to share housing, but it's supported by the cultural norm of we're going to take you in and we're not going to, we're going to make sure that you at least have some place to be. Um, you can go to the next slide, Zach. And so I'm going to kind of skip over this because we've talked through McKinney-Vento already in our time together over the last um, month or so. Um, but just want to say that we know that students and families are in just some particularly dire situations right now um, with communities that are receiving large numbers of immigrant families. Um, we know that there are just more and more situations that are eligible under McKinney-Vento. I recently talked to someone in Massachusetts who shared with me that the immigrant students in her school district um, are renting closet space and that's their place that they're going. And so they rented in a 12 hour shift. And so they maybe have that closet, particular closet, like literal closet space. And then they get to stay there for 12 hours and then someone else comes in and it's their closet space for 12 hours. And so she said she's seeing a large number of students and families in that situation and really in um, eligible under McKinney-Vento because of that. Here, Karen, next can I ask back. a quick question? Absolutely. Do you all ever look into um, issues about, uh, specifically with people in shared housing and shared spaces? I was thinking about this, especially in a precarious situation with um, migrant and immigrant students, but when, when, when we send mail to um, 
in doubled up situations. I, I worry about this because I, I had someone close to me who um, had a friend stay with him and have mail sent there and then established residency. Do you all ever offer any kind of a situation? Is that ever a concern about sending mail and, and it may be destabilizing the housing situation or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's true. Um, on that? Yeah, I think that's true for any of our families who are doubled up. But you're right. Absolutely. When we, it comes to immigrant um, families who might be in those doubled up or tripled up or quadrupled up situations, um, sending mail there can be a really, um, it can be really tricky. And so I will say, um, when I was in a district, one of the things that I heard is when our enrollment office or when our schools would send mail to families and it would come back, they would say, well, clearly this family doesn't live at this address or they don't live in the district anymore. And what would happen is not that the family wasn't temporarily staying there. It was that the person whose residence it actually was, who had the family doubled up with them, couldn't accept mail because it would jeopardize their own lease. Um, and so of course, that family was in the family that was trying to receive the mail was in a doubled up situation. And so we really worked with our families to say, what is the best way to get you this information? Is it sending it home in your student's backpack? Is it having things maybe using um, using the school as kind of a, a way of delivering the mail. So from the district office, we would get the information to the school and the school would make sure the family had the information like the social worker or the building point of contact. Um, or is it setting up a PO box with the family to help them? Um, now, of course, we couldn't pay for that, but we could help them kind of navigate the process to set that up so that they would have a place to get their mail. Um, and, and so some I post, think- Some postmasters. I'll, if they have space, allow for that, and they can look that up online. It's it's post office by post office, but it is a program through the through the mail. Homeless families. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think kind of thinking creatively, and I think anytime you have families in that doubled up situation. Um, I think it's really making sure, like, is this going to cause a problem if I send this mail to your if to at this address um, to the place where you're staying? Or is this going to jeopardize the housing of the person who is permanently housed there who has taken you in? And I think sometimes with our immigrant families, um, and I will say, I think this is specific to immigrant families because migrant families are many of them are used to being highly mobile because of that agricultural work. But with our immigrant families, they're coming in and they're not they're not familiar with our educational system. It's a very different country to country. And so if you have new families coming in to register in school and um, you are trying to um, you know figure out, okay, where are you staying? Where can we what can we put as your address? I think there's going to be there could potentially be a lot of fear for families or for youth around that and you want my address but i'm only temporarily staying or i'm sleeping on their couch but i don't i can't put their housing in jeopardy why do you need this i don't understand um so there it really could it, it could cause some barriers to that enrollment because of either that fear or that not understanding kind of the, our educational processes here and so um, for that reason, I would say making sure that families know why we're asking questions is really important. Building those relationships is critical, making sure that we have someone who can communicate in the, in the language that the family or the youth needs um, is really important. But letting families know, you know what, we're asking this question because sometimes we may need to mail things to you. What's the best way to do that? Um, or we're asking this question because whatever the situation is, but letting families know is going to help them to understand kind of our educational system a little bit better and the process of why we're asking that. So hopefully that answers your question. All right, so let's skip ahead to talk about unaccompanied youth under McKinney-Vento. We've talked a little bit about this already, um, but again, it's a child or youth lacking fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence who is also not in the physical custody of a parent or legal guardian. Um, so that's a big mouthful, but when we talk about unaccompanied youth, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to start with whether or not they meet that definition under McKinney-Vento before we're looking at whether or not they're with a parent or legal guardian. So first, under McKinney-Vento, they must be experiencing homelessness and then not in the custody of a parent or legal guardian. Um, so we know with our youth, they run away from home due to so many reasons, conflict in the home, 
Um, it could be abuse, it could be substance abuse, um, parent or parental or guardian substance abuse, it could be pregnancy, it could be sexual orientation, just so many reasons. Um, and so with our unaccompanied youth who are unaccompanied from an immigration perspective, we are also seeing an increase of unaccompanied youth under McKinney-Vento because many of those older youth that are coming to the U.S., um, so I'm talking like high school age-ish youth, um, who are coming to the U.S. are coming alone with no parent or guardian, and they're living with friends or relatives or um, sometimes sponsors, which we're going to talk more about, um, or wherever they can stay. And so we want to make sure that we're getting those students enrolled in school and then also identifying them under McKinney-Vento. Um, on the next slide, I mentioned some of this, but I want to talk about sponsors because sponsors are a question that we get all the time at Schoolhouse. So many times when an unaccompanied youth, again, now we're looking at kind of that immigration status um, perspective of this. Many times our unaccompanied youth come and they will stay with a sponsor. Um, and we hear that word sponsor, sponsor, we talk, it's in the news, it's in just kind of the media, it's, it's all over the place. But it's really important to know that sponsors don't have any kind of legal guardianship. In fact, I heard recently that only only something like seven to 8% of sponsors go through any kind of vetting process. So it's not necessarily even a safe place for students. It doesn't mean that if a youth is going to live with a sponsor that they automatically have fixed regular and adequate nighttime residence. Um, there are sometimes sponsors that say, great, you can come and stay here. You can sleep on my couch, but here are the, all of the conditions of you coming to stay on my couch. Um, it might be paying back immigration expenses. It might be contributing to household expenses. Um, they may have whatever those kind of certain criteria or conditions are. So it's not just that they're saying, yes, I'll take you and I'll take care of you. Um, and again, because they're not going through, many are not going through a really um, vet, a, a solid vetting process, um, a sponsor really can be anyone who is saying, yep, I'll take you in. Um, so sometimes when there are those financial obligations for youth who are staying with a sponsor, um, it may, may really make it difficult for that youth to attend and engage in school. So like I said, if there's conditions that are financial and they're saying um, you have to pay a certain amount toward our household expenses or um, we helped support your immigration, um, ex your immigration journey to the U.S. and you need to pay back X, Y, Z amount. Um, it can be really hard for youth to say, yeah, I want to get in school and I want to start attending school um, because they're thinking I have to get a job. I have to contribute to these. I'm also maybe contributing financially to family who is in my home country. Um, and so we want to really think about that when we're thinking about engaging youth. And I'm going to offer you some strategies, but not quite yet. So we'll get to those um, in a little bit. So I mentioned this overlap and I like to just kind of show this chart because it just kind of helps us think about so many of our unaccompanied youth who are coming here um, through their immigration process are actually eligible under McKinney-Vento as well as an unaccompanied homeless youth. And so when we're enrolling students, it's really important to be asking those questions and doing it in a really sensitive way so that we can make sure we're identifying as many of these unaccompanied youth as possible. So on the next slide, I wanna talk about immediate enrollment for unaccompanied youth. Um, and just kind of remind you a little bit about McKinney-Vento and then offer some strategies as well for this. Um, so unlike most education laws, McKinney-Vento does give rights directly to unaccompanied youth above the rights of their parents or guardians. Now, many of our unaccompanied youth, um, again, thinking about that immigration perspective who are coming to the US, um, don't have that the parent or guardian, legal guardian anyway, to be enrolling them in school. So we want to make sure um, that we're really thinking about getting those youth in school and how to do that. And then thinking through who could kind of be that caregiver or that emergency contact or, um, you know, who, who can we give that kind of educational guardianship to? Um, that doesn't give any legal guardianship, but it just says this person's taking responsibility for this child's education, maybe signing forms or calling in attendance, things like that. Um, so it's important to think through kind of what your own district process is for making sure that there is some kind of caregiver listed for our unaccompanied youth. And I would say that's a good practice for any unaccompanied youth, regardless of if it's an 
an immigrant student or if it's just um, another student that you've identified. I do wanna say in many cases or in some cases, um, a sponsor may not be an appropriate caregiver for a student. So we have heard stories about sponsors who are trafficking students, um, who are um, forcing them into labor trafficking or whatever that might look like. And it's not actually a safe situation for that student. Again, so many sponsors don't go through a vetting process that we don't really know what kind of living situation that our students are in. Um, and so as we're talking to youth and as we're enrolling youth, it's really important to ask that question of who is, who is someone that we could list as a caregiver and not just assume it's that sponsor. Um, I worked with a student um, when I first got started many, many years ago um, in the school district. And this student was one of the first immigrant students that I worked with. Um, and he came in to enroll on his own. He was an unaccompanied youth in his immigration status and he was an unaccompanied youth in his McKinney-Bento status. Um, and he was really very hesitant to share with me what his situation was and kind of who we could count as a caregiver. Um, he was bouncing around. He had actually seven older brothers who lived in our community already, adult age brothers, and he was bouncing around between all seven of their apartments. And some of the situations were better for him than others. Um, and so when we kind of talked through, it doesn't have to be the person that you're staying with right now. Is there one of your older brothers that we could just list as an emergency contact? You know, who could that be? We really looked at all of the different options that he had and picked the one where he felt the most comfortable saying, okay, this is a person you could call if you needed something. Um, and so it took some time and it took some navigating that situation to really figure out who that best caregiver or emergency contact would be. But it was really important for him um, because he wanted to make sure that it was kind of the, the safer choice for him, safer um, both emotionally and physically for him. So um, we talked a little bit about shared housing uh, um, before when we were talking about doubled up, but I like to come back to this again, thinking through um, is it circumstance supported by cultural norms? So we wanna make sure we're asking the right questions to our families when we're enrolling them if they are in these shared housing situations. Um, again, we don't wanna say or do something that's going to um, discourage our families or our youth from enrolling in school. And we also really wanna to try to be culturally competent as much as we can. So for many of us, that means we have an interpreter or we have um, someone who might be bilingual or bicultural that's a part of our process to connect with and talk with our families. Um, one thing I wanna highlight in particular on this slide is sponsors don't change our analysis of McKinney-Vento. So again, just because they're staying with the sponsor doesn't mean that it's, that it's fixed, regular, and adequate. So we still have to look at all of those situations on an individual basis. And on the next slide, we'll talk about some cultural considerations of doubled up. Um, so again, thinking through so many families from so many countries have this kind of value of shared housing or multi-generational living situations. Um, my husband's family is from Peru. And one of the things that they, um, that's just very normal in their family situation is that they had a multi-generational living situation in Peru before the, everyone kind of started dispersing and um, all of that long story, but they had many families that were living in their, their housing and they shared housing and that was their cultural norm. That was what they did. Um, but when my husband's mother came to the US, she was also in a shared housing situation and it wasn't because it was part of now this cultural multi-generational multi living situation. It was because she had nowhere else to go. So we really wanna look at who is on that lease. Um, are they contributing to household costs? Do they have adequate space to sleep? Or again, are they renting closet space? Is the living arrangement um, for everyone's mutual benefit or are people looking for their own place to live? Um, so again, circumstance supported by cultural norms. And I wanna give you two quick examples. I know um, we have a long way to go on our slides here, but also um, I think these examples are important. So I wanna to pause to give you these. Um, when I was working as a liaison, I had two different families that I worked with that really exemplified this very well. So the first was a family of three brothers who came to the US, but before they came to the US, these three brothers, adult age brothers got together and said, 
we're going to move to this community where we know other people. We're going to buy a house together. Our three families are going to live together. We're going to share childcare help. We're going to share costs for things. Um, we're going to learn how to navigate a new educational system and a new country and culture together. And it was a planned arrangement before they ever got to the US that they were going to live together. So when they came to enroll the students, we saw, oh, well, there's three families living together in this housing. Um, and so, of course, our first question was, well, tell us more about your living situation. And it was very clear that this was a planned arrangement. Nobody was looking for other housing. Their intent was to stay together and to really provide that support to each other. Um, and so that was not a McKinney Vento situation. They were not identified. On the other hand, um, I had a student who she came to the US and they didn't have a plan. Um, they were fleeing some domestic violence and some other violence in their home country and came to the US. And an aunt took the student in and the aunt and uncle had a trailer where they lived with their two kids. And then they had a family of five move in with them. And then they had another grandparent move in with them. And before we knew it, there were nine people or 10 people living in this trailer, which was not made for 10 people. And this was very clearly a situation of, okay, these students are sleeping on the floor of this trailer. They're trying to figure out what their next steps are. They need to figure out how to get jobs um, or income so they can rent their own place. But right now they're in housing that's not adequate. And even though the family said to them, we'll take you in because we don't want you to be on the street or we don't want you to be unsheltered or whatever, um, we'll take you in so you at least have a roof over your head for now. That was not a permanent situation for them. Um, so just a couple of examples that I wanted to um, just kind of point out of thinking through their cultural value was we're not going to let you not have a place to go. So come and stay with us. We'll figure it out. We've got floor space. We'll just make it work. Um, and again, that was kind of their circumstance supported by cultural norms. And I see there's a question in the chat about sharing the PowerPoint. Um, and I will send these to Zach. Um, with all of the live links with resources at the end. So you all will have access to these. Um, okay, so I want to start out with, again, just reiterate, reiterating that um, every situation needs to be evaluated individually. With our immigrant students, with our migrant students, and with any other student that we think might be in a McKinney-Vento situation, it's always on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, immigration and documentation does not affect McKinney-Vento eligibility. Um, and I do have a slide later on about public charge because that's been a question over the years of does um, McKinney-Vento as a federal identification, does that affect public charge? Um, so we will hopefully have time to talk about that, but otherwise the information you need will be on that slide. Um, and so want to just say again, the right to public education for immigrant children, undocumented children, extends to any kind of preschool program that's administered by the LEA. Um, Head Start and Early Head Start are also um, resources that can be accessed by families regardless of their immigration status. Um, and of course, this also applies to migrant students that they have the right to free public education. Uh, but I will say that over the years, as I've had this conversation about immigrant and migrant children and youth, um, Sometimes this tends to be more of a struggle for LEAs with their immigrant students because they're not quite sure how to navigate that more so than with their migrant students. Um, I just wanted to point that out. And we've already talked about sponsors, so we can go to the next slide. And this is where I really want to pause to spend some time on these strategies and best practices to support our immigrant and migrant children and youth. Um, so again, when we're thinking about our immigrant and our migrant children and youth, um, what I have heard over the years is that some of the challenges really are we're getting an influx of immigrant children and youth or families in our district. Um, we don't have specific programs for them, whereas migrant education is its own specific federal program. So on these slides, the strategies and best practices apply to both immigrant and migrant children and youth, but I'm going to focus more on talking about our immigrant students because more LEAs have larger populations of immigrant children and youth than they do of migrant, if that makes sense. Um, so we'll focus a little bit more on just kind of talking about our immigrant children and youth, but again, these do apply to our migrant families as well. Um, okay, so some strategies. We wanna make sure we're identifying any immigrant or of course migrant family who is experiencing homelessness. And it's so important to be collaborating across programs to provide these wraparound services. Um, and so 
One example that I like to give is uh, Metro Nashville Public Schools in Tennessee. They have a really, really good relationship. Their McKinney-Vento um, team, I believe there's uh, several of them in the district, but their McKinney-Vento team is so connected to their Title III or their um, English learner. Um, I know it's called different things in different districts, but their multilingual, um, bilingual, bicultural kind of learning program, so under Title III. The two programs are so connected and so cross-trained that Metro Nashville Public Schools gets 30% of their referrals for McKinney-Vento from their Title III staff. So from their teachers who work with their English learners um, and their other staff members who work with English learners are referring 30% of those students identified under McKinney-Vento. And they said um, so many times, there's, there's no distinction between our programs. We just know if you talk to one person in one program, they're gonna know, okay, you might be eligible under, for um, language services. We're gonna make sure you're connected with our language services department or the vice versa. You might be eligible under McKinney-Vento. We're gonna make sure you're talking with our homeless liaison um, and her team. So it's a really great idea to collaborate across those programs not only to provide the, that identification support, but then it's also those wraparound services. And it's all, it might be tutoring, it might be um, you know, connecting with community resources, and it might be that your multilingual department has connections already to organizations who partner and support immigrant students. Um, so really that collaboration will be key to meeting the needs of families. Um, of course, we want to provide families with information and support they can access, and by this I'm particularly thinking about the language piece. Um, so, for example, um, New Philadelphia City Schools in Ohio works with a Spanish-speaking interpreter to enroll students in school. Um, so they were recognizing that so many of their students and families um, were coming in speaking an indigenous language as a first language and Spanish as a second language um, in this particular district. And so they couldn't simply hand a Spanish translated form to the family and expect them to just complete it for enrollment. Um, they were really struggling with that. And so this particular interpreter goes through all of the forms verbally with the family to be able to explain the meaning of doubled up or to explain the meaning of McKinney-Vento to make sure they understand all the enrollment issues. And it really works to remove kind of that literacy roadblock to identifying students. Um, so I think that's a great strategy, when, especially when thinking about McKinney-Vento and thinking about sharing McKinney-Vento rights and things like that. Um, again, we want to think about what those other barriers might be. And I do like to share one last example around this um, with a school district in Minnesota, so Shakopee Public Schools. I share this example all the time because I think it's really fantastic. They had a recent... Um, within the last couple of years, a recent influx of unaccompanied youth from an immigration lens and an unaccompanied youth from McKinney-Vento lens. So again, kind of cross-identified in that situation. And the students were really struggling to just kind of navigate all of it. Um, they had been through some pretty significant trauma in their immigration experience. So the district hired a therapist, a bilingual bicultural therapist to come into the schools and really work with these unaccompanied youth, again, unaccompanied in their immigration status and unaccompanied in their McKinney-Vento status to navigate the immigration trauma and provide that wraparound service of those counseling supports. Um, so I think that's just always a great example of one thing that we can do. Um, they did fund that through their ARPHCY funds, um, but they do have a plan to continue that when the funds are no longer available as well. Um, on the next slide, I will start out by saying relationships are the key to all of this. So whether it's working with our immigrant and migrant children and youth, or whether it's working with um, other families that we've identified under McKinney-Vento, or whoever it is, relationships are really the key to all of it. And building that trust is so, so important. Um, we know so many families who are here and navigating new places um, and new systems they can be really, um, really fearful of what that looks like. And so as school staff, it's really our job to say, um, we want to connect with them. We want to help them understand. We want to build that trust. We want them to be able to reach out to us to ask their questions, things like that. Um, and we want to really think about how we can accommodate unique circumstances for students. So I mentioned New Philadelphia City Schools before um, when I was talking about their interpreter who works with families during enrollment. But I also wanna share one unique thing that they have done 
um, to kind of accommodate the unique circumstances of their unaccompanied youth, both unaccompanied youth, um, again, these are youth who are unaccompanied from an immigration lens and unaccompanied from a McKinney-Vento lens. Um, they knew that so many of their families were missing school, or their youth, I'm sorry, um, so many of their youth were missing school because they had financial responsibilities. And so they decided that they needed to acknowledge that that was reality and then figure out how to honor both education and work responsibilities. Um, and so they worked with this particular population of youth um, to arrange their schedules in such a way that if students would commit to regular attendance, they could end their school day early to go to work. Um, and so it was putting a study hall at the end of their day, and I'm not sure how they navigated all of the pieces of that, um, but they had students commit to attending their classes and then they could leave their school day early to go to their jobs to meet those financial obligations. And they saw their attendance significantly increase from making that accommodation. And it wasn't even like they said, you only have to come for two hours of the day. It was just kind of that end, that end class period of the day that they would release students early when they were committed to this attendance. Um, during the rest of the day. So I'm sure there were other things that were kind of the ins and outs of how they navigated that piece of it, but I really, really appreciated the way that they decided we just need to acknowledge that this is happening and figure out how to get our students in school and also give them the space to meet these other obligations that they have. Um, I did provide some additional resources. If you are not familiar with Colorín Colorado, um, it is a really excellent resource. They've got a lot on family engagement and building relationships. They've also got things on language acquisition. Um, so it's really a great resource. These are just a couple of links from their website, but definitely check that out if you are looking for um, some additional tools. All right, on the next slide, I wanna talk about the unique needs of our migrant children and youth. And so, as I said previously, those strategies and best practices absolutely could be applied to our migrant families, um, but our migrant families also have their own unique needs. And so I see that we are um, very quickly running out of time. So I'm gonna share this and then I wanna take some questions from you and I'll make sure you have these slides so that you can see the things that we didn't get to. And I would love to continue the conversation with you if you have any questions about it. Um, but our migrant children and youth um, are also many times in situations that meet the definition of McKinney-Vento. Um, when I worked in migrant education, I had the opportunity to visit several of our migrant camps and to see the, um, the housing that families were in and how many families were in different places, um, just that doubled up piece certainly, but also the, the lack of adequacy was really stark for many of our families. So it's really important that when we're thinking about our migrant families, yes, they're eligible under the Migrant Education Program or Title I-C, um, but they may also be eligible under McKinney-Vento. And so we want to make sure that there's a clear process for identifying them under both programs. Um, so just to share very briefly, there's a district in Colorado who works with their regional office um, in Colorado, and the regional office is responsible for their migrant education program. So the McKinney-Vento team in this district has provided cross-training and partnership with this regional office and their migrant education program to make sure that both groups are cross-trained so that any time that they identify a student, they're saying, okay, are you eligible under McKinney-Vento? Are you eligible for our migrant education program? And they're identifying both at one time because they're so well-trained in both programs. They've also established a data sharing system. And I know there's so many questions about how to do data sharing and I don't have all the answers for that of how they made this work. But somehow they set up a data system where they could share that data back and forth of who was identified both as migrant students and under McKinney-Vento. And they were seeing this increase in collaboration really led to um, further identification and an increase in the identification between both programs. Um, so just as, as you're thinking about who are the families and who are the students in your district, uh, make sure that you're partnering with your migrant education programs um, in addition to whatever kind of multilingual um, or ESL type programs that you have in your district. All right, I wanna very quickly talk about higher education opportunities um, on the next slide for unaccompanied, um, sorry, for undocumented youth. Um, this is a whole can of worms. <laughs> And I will say the information that I have um, both on higher education and on some of the upcoming slides about the different immigration statuses, um, this is information that changes with the political climate. So 
take this, what you see on this slide, kind of with a grain of salt and know that you may need to look for updates as political thing, as political climates change. So as new people are elected and they decide to make changes in their state, whatever those changes are, this information could change based on that. Um, and just to give you an example, Wisconsin, um, used to do in-state tuition for undocumented youth. And then with a change um, in our governor, the governor decided a number of years ago, um, nope, we're not gonna do in-state tuition anymore for undocumented youth and that changed. And then we had a new governor a few years after that and it changed back again. So this is very fluid depending on kind of the political climate. Um, so I do wanna say that undocumented youth are not eligible for FAFSA. Um, they, I would say in general, I would not recommend that an unaccompanied youth even fill out a FAFSA um, application. I have heard over the years that sometimes that can be a flag for immigration um, and just can cause some challenges for students. So if a student knows they're undocumented, I would say don't even, don't even have them fill out the application. However, if a student is documented, if a student was born in the US, um, but their parents were not, they can still complete that FAFSA application. Um, so it's again thinking through and how do we have those conversations? How do we talk about that? Um, and then also making sure that you know what kind of in-state financial aid might be available or what kind of scholarships might be available. And I do provide a link to updated information that's updated regularly. So when I put these slides together, this was the latest information that I had. Um, so it's fairly recent, but it may change again, just kind of depending on, on political climate. So um, I do have some examples of using ARPHCY funds to support um, immigrant um, and migrant families, um, children and youth. And I'm going to not talk about these and give you all of the details. You can read them on the slide, um, but we'll just put out the caveat of you can absolutely use your ARP funds to find ways to support immigrant, um, immigrant students experiencing homelessness in your district with the caveat of make sure that you're checking with Zach and his team um, with your ideas and moving forward on those. So. Um, I'm going to just give you a heads up about what's on these slides. And again, I will share these slides with you so you have all of this, um, but we don't have too much time to cover it. And I knew that we wouldn't, but like I said, I wanted you to have the information. Um, this landscape, so this is constantly changing. And again, when I put these slides together, this was the most up-to-date information that I had. And when I sent my slides to, to Zach and to his team, um, we realized that I had put the slides together even before a recent court ruling that happened like less than a week ago, I think, or maybe a week or so ago. Um, and so I went back in and changed the link to that. And so just, I say all of that by way of saying, this is a constantly changing landscape when we're looking at these. Um, so don't take all of this as the final, like this is how it is and nothing can change because this is constantly updating. So countries that are listed for temporary prote protected status, which gives work authorization, um, that, that's constantly changing. The list of countries that are eligible for this is constantly changing. Um, it may have already changed from two weeks ago when I put the slides together. So, um, so I wanna just provide you with all of that information and you'll have it and you can take a look at that. Um, and I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you have about that. Even if you think of them two weeks from now or two months from now, you can always reach out to me and talk more about those. Um, so I want to just pause here because I just gave you a whole lot of information um, and see if there are any questions that you have. And I'm looking in the chat. So somebody asked, um, a planned living situation isn't always adequate. And I would say that's true. Um, you can... Uh, again, this is a case by case situation. And so I'm trying to think of a good example for you. Um, but you could say, yep, my family is coming to live with me. We have decided that this is how it's going to be for mutual benefit. Um, they're going to move into my house. Well, the reality is I may not have room for three or four people in my house. And so we find that 
Um, you know, it makes more sense for someone to be sleeping on the floor or someone to be sleeping on the couch in the living room just to get some safe space or some of their own personal space. Um, and so it's very possible that it may not actually be an adequate situation. And so typically when it's a planned arrangement and you've got that arrangement ahead of time, you think through all of those and you plan for all of those and where everyone's going to go. But certainly there are times when it's not an adequate situation and somebody ends up sleeping on the floor or something changes in that living situation. Um, sometimes we hear of things that, yep, it was a planned arrangement. I took this family in. Um, I wanted to have them, you know, I wanted to give them a place to be. We're going to make it work. And then two months from now, it doesn't work out. And I'm saying, you got to go. I, I can't have you here anymore. I'm, there's too many people in my house. It's too chaotic. You got to go. And then it becomes a homeless situation. And so looking on, at all of those on a case by case basis will be absolutely critical. Excuse me, I want to take a minute uh, to remind everyone that the link has been provided for the ELA credit um, by Jennifer in the chat. And I want to remind everyone to um, complete that Google form. And um, Karen, you can take the rest of the time to finish your presentation and thank you for this webinar series. If there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer those. Um, otherwise, like I said, you are more than welcome to reach out to me if you if you don't have any immigrant students or any migrant students in your district right now, but six months from now you do, you can always reach out to me or to Zach at that time. And Zach and I can certainly collaborate and talk um, anytime there are questions. So I will just drop my email into the chat. So you've got it again. Um, you've probably seen it before, but that's all right. So feel free to reach out, but if there are no other questions, um, I, I know that was a lot of information, but like I said, you'll have access to these slides. Um, and so please feel free to reach out anytime. Yes, all, all of the webinars are available on the KDE Media Portal page for the Office of Continuous Improvement. And um, I had sent out the partial credit one. Um, I sent out that this morning. It takes a little bit of time for us to go back through and remove notes and uh, double check those things and send out the message. So um, I'll, I'll be doing that um, shortly, but um, often before then you'll be able to find the video of the webinar on the media portal page. So if you need the video from today's webinar before then, um, It'll probably be up before you get the email from me. Do we have any questions? Well, this has been very popular, Karen, and I am so grateful and I have really enjoyed the time with you. It has, uh, I have received numerous emails from people um, thanking me and tell and asking me to thank you. I've received feedback from people inside the department who are very grateful for this opportunity. And I know that um, people will be watching these videos in the future and they're a great resource. So. <clears throat> Thank you for showing up today with when you had your cough. Um, I know that's not fun and um, we just look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure and I will look forward to any kind of partnership opportunity that we have again. Yeah. So I'm happy Me to help too. Me too. And uh, if not, I guess I will see you in New Orleans. Plans have changed and I will be there. So. <laughs> I will be there, so I'll see, I'll see you then, if not. Um, it is 11, so if there are no questions, I'm going to end the recording um, because I have to travel uh, for work. After the, I've had all these traveling appointments on the same day as the webinar, so um, thank you so much, Karen, for joining us, and thank you, everyone across the state, for watching this or watching the recording of it. Have a great day. Thank you.